Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here bright and early in the morning. Some of you who are on uh, North American time, it's up a little early for us, maybe, but uh, here we are. Um, so uh, I want to thank Dave. He, Dave was just a, it was, he was such, how long have you been here? Five years now? Five years. I mean, it was such a fine to have Dave DeRora come. And uh, we love it. I always love it in libraries when you have someone who's so forward thinking who also appreciates uh, libraries. So that's great. And I also want to thank someone who's not able to be here today, but Chris Borgman, who I think is sort of responsible for my uh, coming here and, and speaking. So when I was trying to think about this, this talk, uh, this, uh, when you near that point where you have to send in your title and your abstract, I was thinking a lot about scale. And then more recently, I was thinking of the Financial Times called 2014 the year of disruption. And a lot of talking about disruption. And I was thinking about how over my career, people have told me that libraries were going to be disintermediated, they were going to go away. And this seemed an opportunity to talk about that as well as, as scale. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting. If you type in uh, into Google, libraries and dinosaurs, well, this, this little thing from um, last week came up. Uh, Our libraries, the dinosaurs of the digital age. And I thought it was fantastic. It's from Santa Fe, and it's illustrated with a photograph of the Radcliffe camera. So I, uh, this was meant to be. Now, actually, if you read this nice little article, the, the guy goes on to talk about how libraries are changing. So it's actually a provocative headline and a pretty positive uh, piece. But, you know, another thing that um, these libraries that I've had experience with, I've also been at the Library of Congress, um, and, and then if you think of Cornell, Harvard, uh, and Oxford, it's, uh, they are compared to ocean liners that are really, really difficult. And this particular ocean liner, you know which this is? Titanic, yeah? Um, well, it actually helped fund, in a way, Widener Library, which is where my office is, uh, because Harry Elkins Widener was on the Titanic um, having, um, he was a young class of 2000, um, 1907 um, Harvard graduate, and he was a book collector. And uh, this is the year, 1915, when this building opened, so we're celebrating its uh, centennial. But in a way, they're both dinosaurs. And when you think about um, Cliff Lintut, uh, Chris Lintut yesterday talking about the threshold barrier uh, for people going into these austere, uh, imposing, magnificent buildings, uh, that's one of the challenges we have at, at Widener is it's both awesome and inspiring, but also off-putting to some of the people we'd like to have come in. So I've also been collecting over the years uh, these uh, news articles that predict the demise of libraries. And this was on the front page of the, of the New York Times in 2004. Um, in the early Google days, talking about how the library is trying to fit in that the catalog is the old search engine. And then the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, published, uh, and this might be the Christian Science Monitor, they did them both in the same year, um, these features called the deserted library. And it was all about how in the digital age, no one was going to libraries. And this poor woman in Kansas sitting there in her big overall, overalls in a completely non-electronic uh, reading room. And then more recently, uh, last July, uh, the Guardian uh, with this uh, contributor, Tim Warstel, talking about uh, close the libraries and buy everyone an Amazon Kindle unlimited subscription, uh, where uh, Huffington Post was getting kind of puffy about Amazon's uh, Kindle Unlimited and saying, well, they're trying to sell them a library card for $120 uh, for, the, for the year subscription. So people, you know, people have talked about that. Should uh, what do we need libraries for when everything is digital? And Kindle contributes. Amazon and Kindle contribute to this um, kind of uh, stereotype, I think, in in libraries. Uh, full disclosure: my son works for Amazon, actually, and uh, does Audible Kindle.
Schindel sort of cross-marketing. So um, um, I, you know, I'm not entirely biased about them. But when they get these uh, people, you know, ordinary uh, citizens standing there saying, it's just like a library, um, then it, it, it implants in people that idea. Now, of course, librarians can be kind of feisty. So some of them do graffiti on, on, on these things. <laughs> If it's just like a library, why not go to libraries? Okay. And then this is one of my favorites, probably way too small for you to be able to read, but this extinction timeline, um, which uh, shows, I think in about 2019, uh, libraries will, their existence will be insignificant beyond that date. And, um, you know, I think a lot of their other predictions are right. You know, they've got uh, Tony Blair, although I did hear him on the radio this morning. Um, go, go, being insignificant. Uh, keys, you know, I love it, not having keys anymore, never getting lost. And out here in 2050, can you see 2050, you know, there's no more ugliness because the world has been bred out of things. So, you know, there are a lot of good things to look forward to. And the fact that libraries are, are going to be extinct, copyright is in there too. So, um, you know, I think it just shows uh, how we need to look at our our preconceptions of what something is, and then think about how the world is changing around us. So libraries have been reinventing themselves, and uh, of course you see here the kind of classic internet cafe library. This is Duke, it's uh, really fantastic. It is a kind of social and intellectual hub in a buffer zone between the uh, social exterior and then as people begin to move inside. So that's a kind of physical uh, reinvention. And um, uh, Dave mentioned that I had been at Cornell, and there I was involved, I, I went there in 96, and so in the late 90s and early 2000s, I was working on a number of projects that were related to scholarly communications. Um, we were thinking about ourselves as a web hosts, really, um, Project Muse had started with Johns Hopkins, uh, with Mellon Money. Um, Highwire Press had come into being uh, web hosting. And if you go to the uh, Wayback Machine and you look at what Highwire said it was doing when it started, as opposed to now, um, it was part of that uh, rhetoric of changing the world of publishing and, and getting out of the bind that people were in with subscription prices. It, they've moderated their, uh, their mission. And uh, the project that I was involved in at, at Cornell called Project Euclid was one in which we took um, small, mostly small, independent maths and statistics journals and um, got them as they were making that transition from paper to print to, to digital. And, and so instead of having to go to a large commercial organization, we were pledging to keep things um, fairly uh, uh, affordable. About two thirds of the content in Project Euclid is um, open access now, so the, the, it has been a contribution to open access. Uh, I did feel when I was, I can remember the moment when I was looking at the bottom line and realizing we might be $250,000 in the red and thinking, oh my God, I can't take that out of the maths uh, materials budget, you know, I mean, uh, we better make this sustainable. When I left in 2007, it was uh, sustainable. And uh, Dean Kraft is here, he'll be able to keep you up to date on what's happening, but I think it's still uh, in, in the black. So it's, it's been an interesting experiment um, that has, is, is part of something that many libraries are doing and uh, moving into the publishing arena. But there's a lot libraries don't know about uh, marketing and distribution and um, running. The people know about the technical operations, but not some of the ex fields of expertise. Um, and then there were uh, disciplinary repositories were um, still relatively new. Paul Ginsberg had started in 91, the um, Los Alamos preprint archive, and he was moving to Cornell in uh, 2000, 2001, I guess. And when 
I heard that Paul was coming to Cornell. He was having a joint appointment in physics and uh, in um, computing and information science. I went to the president and said, actually, archive belongs in the library. It's a 24 by 7 information service, and we should have that. And uh, I can remember Paul saying to me, well, how can we be sure that um, when there's a budget cut, it won't be cut loose? And uh, I said, well, we have this Icelandic collection uh, that no one ever comes to see, and we still have a curator. Of, oh, well, that's not quite true. But I mean, yeah, I mean, not the most heavily used collection in the world. And yet, we supported that. So that was my commitment to tr begin to treat some of these um, new services the way we had treated our special collections. Um, Cornell, uh, after, uh, and now I can't remember when that was, in 2009, 2012, I think Cornell moved to a new business model because there were some additional funding losses in its support, and now it's uh, supported by its heaviest users, our campus. And then we had institutional repositories, uh, which also initially, I think, uh, when we were starting institutional repositories, again, it was supposed to be a bulwark against um, um, the closed world of commercial publishing. And then as we began to realize, in many respects, the benefits of having a record of the intellectual output of the university, and also in including more than the um, the, the journal article, that it became a much richer uh, resource. So um, many of the institutions that have treated it in that way have had highly successful um, open access institutional repositories. So as we were putting in place in libraries some of these um, uh, mechanisms to support scholarly communications in the, in the academy, there were some counter moves in the, in the publishing world, which were embargoes, uh, gold open access, and um, new services that were taking advantage of the, the publishing data that, that um, publishers had. And I may be, it may be that Harvard is the last place in the world that this is, is still the case. Um, I, people at Harvard are still very exercised about the high costs of journals and see uh, the institutional repository as a way of, of, um, of mitigating that in, in some way. I really am separating open access from uh, journal pricing. I'm not, I'm not interested in the journal pricing issue at this point. I'm interested in making our collections and the world of knowledge more open. Uh, so now I'm saying that. So, and, you know, and one of the reasons is um, after I've had all of these years of experience, we see progressively more and more material is open, but we don't see the, the subscriptions uh, le letting uh, go in terms of uh, what we have to commit in libraries. On the other hand, uh, we see that the very nature of scholarship is changing as a result of the tools that are available to us today, and the way in which society around us is changing. So we, we see a continuous dialogue. Oh, and actually here, this breaking the book, Laura Mandel. Uh, I heard Laura Mandel speak at a, uh, a conference in October, and the citation is down below to the um, Association of Research Libraries presentation that she made. I thought she was fantastic, and the, and the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, is running an interview with her, I think this week, uh, about her new book, Waking the Book, which has just been released in Print Humanities in the Digital Age. Uh, and so a lot of these things are, are things which uh, she talks about in much more detail and more, more eloquently. But the idea that one does, and we talked about this yesterday. One doesn't just have uh, the article itself. You have the methodology. You have the comments on it. You have the correction. So it's a continuous dialogue, and it's, it's sort of nonlinear in a way that, that it goes on. 
the fact that we're able to use uh, data mining to uh, 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 get more out of, of what we have, that we're reusing data. The, uh, again, this was spoken about yesterday, moving away from the individual, the sort of solo practitioner, to team-based activities, extremely important. So multiple authorship and the concept of authorship uh, shifting, uh, the ability to embed uh, different forms of media into one's communication. And the fact that we move just as the individual moves to be part of a team, institutionally, we're working across the institution, and then we're working across multiple institutions, multinational, and indeed global. And I think uh, another aspect that is, is, is really interesting in the, in the field of scholarly communications, and uh, we were getting at this yesterday when we were talking about the crowdsourcing activity too, um, is what is what is for the scholar and what is the public? And I think we're going to see a blurring of the lines here as we, uh, we again, have to rethink what, what is the nature of, of what we're doing. Um, Laura talked about in her, um, in her presentation in October about uh, Scalar in, in particular. Uh, you know, the tools that are enabling people to, to make this transition from print to digital more facilely. And so I think we need a lot more uh, familiarity with these tools. Uh, you know, I, I, I practice, you know, a focus group of one when I'm going to dinner with people. So I'm at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I'm sitting next to some famous economist at Stanford. I ask him about open access. He has no clue what that is. You know, I mean, we really have to be working on people uh, letting them know uh, what the possibilities are and what the, the benefits are. So what I want to do, I think we need to kind of lose the journal article worry and, and move on and be thinking about all of these other things. Uh, so data, uh, obviously something everybody talks about. But within the library area, we have all of these other formats beyond the text that are uh, fantastic resources. And then I've sort of thrown in down there at the bottom, and then we, obviously the Google Books Project has done a lot on public domain work. I think our next frontier in that kind of area would be to be working on orphan works. So, where does all of this leave libraries? And, and I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion that it's just not sustainable. I can move, you know, like the frog on the lily pad uh, to the next uh, bigger lily pad. So I can be at places like Oxford and Harvard. They're going to be the last men standing in the traditional uh, library world. But I'm looking <laughs> and thinking we need to be a lot, a lot more nimble. And what we're doing right now in the way we acquire material, in the way we describe material, um, and the way we store material just doesn't scale. Uh, there's just too much stuff, and it's too much for a single institution to handle. And so as a result, libraries are really expanding their mission. They're changing what they do and how they do it. So one of the things that uh, we are doing is um, a lot more innovation at Harvard when I uh, arrived a year ago. Uh, there was much talk about a culture of innovation. There have been lots of uh, little mini grants given out to people to develop apps uh, and to, to, to uh, foster that kind of creativity. Stanford, this is kind of an old slide of, of Stanford where they're doing things with linked data and digital forensics. And uh, the digital uh, manuscript interoperability um, that's a, a product called Mirador now, uh, it's been Mellon funded, wonderful ability to compare uh, medieval manuscripts in multiple locations side by side, annotate, very smooth. So I think we're starting now to see some real advances. And then because uh, Chris was talking yesterday uh, about, about crowdsourcing, one of the things that has been very uh, attractive to me is when I think about scale, how can I move beyond uh, the limits of uh, the boundaries of our own uh, library area 
and begin to take advantage of all the scholars out there in the world. Um, I mean, the, the, the opposite side of the coin is I think librarians should contribute more to Wikipedia and to the uh, um, authoritative sources, but there are an awful lot of people who can help. So this is just a slide of the Smithsonian where they're taking their field notes and lab notes and things like that and asking people to uh, transcribe um, data. Uh, this uh, here in terms of, uh, so uh, Mike will <laughs> know about this, but uh, Michael Kurtz will know about this, but astronomical history and promote discovery. And the little um, lead into this is before iPhones and laptops, there were human computers, some of whom worked at the Harvard College Observatory. And this was a, a group of women kind of looking at the night sky, so sort of the beginning of, of uh, crowdsourcing and women in, in, in a way. Um, I think we will move from this kind of crowdsourcing, which, uh, and again, that was discussed a bit yesterday, uh, when do we move to machine learning? When can the, uh, the work that is being done by these multiple um, eyeballs and, and fingers be uh, um, put into patterns that can be made then even more efficient in some way. And uh, Dave, and, uh, we, we, we did work on this project. This is one, uh, kind of an early one called What's the Score at the Bodleian, uh, which was, uh, I had this idea that music cataloging, it's very expensive to do, it's very detailed. And I thought, oh, if we could just put some scores up, and then we could see how people describe them. And I would get music cataloging done in 10 minutes. That would take me 100 years, right? But um, uh, what I didn't kind of factor on was by, letting the, by having the music experts do that, then they wanted to replicate what we had been doing traditionally, <coughs> rather than to see whether a new mode of description would work. Still, uh, the Bodleian got things that had not been uh, cataloged since uh, like 1870 uh, cataloged as a result of this, and people are still uh, working through it. So it's kind of a primitive version, but uh, it does show what one could do. So, you know, investing in innovation, uh, investing in partnerships, that's what I'm talking about, in scale, and I'm really interested in um, some of the work that is being done now. Uh, the two illustrations, uh, the illustration would be Cornell University Library, C-U-L, and Columbia <coughs> University Library, C-U-L, that's why it's too cool, um, is the, uh, came up with an idea to begin to look at, uh, these were two New York research libraries, really, tools in many respects. Uh, they have two library management systems. They have all these people collecting material. They have all these people cataloging material. Did you need all of that uh, to do that? And obviously, the benefit of doing that, maybe not only are you able to do things better and faster and uh, less expensively, but presumably then those resources could be redirected to other areas, like scholarly communications, for example. So, um, the, the areas of interest uh, were um, like cataloging and developing collections, uh, the technology infrastructure and digital preservation. I was interested when I was looking for evidence of, of collaboration. I found an annual report of the Slavic bibliographer at Columbia featuring this pamphlet, which was a, a Russian pamphlet, the, the Queen of Aliga who, uh, was, it was a silent movie, and um, Cornell had acquired it, but it was being featured in, in Columbia's uh, annual reports as, as an achievement. And I think, you know, we're, we're still very much in an embryonic stage in that, but I, I believe that we can move forward. Let's see, did I do that? No. So another uh, thing that we are investing in when, when I was starting my career, the jobs were all for catalogers, reference librarians, 
uh, and then you know, people working in IT or something like that. We have a totally different skill set now that, that we're, we're looking for. We're, we're looking for people who uh, can work with academic departments on visualization. Uh, we have copyright uh, lawyers. We have business uh, people who can do business plans. Obviously, metadata and data curation, things like that, bioinformatics. It's quite interesting. Our statistics at Harvard, uh, we submit to the Association of Research Libraries. And there's been a big debate raging whether we should include the Center for Bioinformatics in our statistics, because it like bumps us up by 15 million. And it's also, you know, people keep saying, well, but is that part of the library? And I'm saying, oh, it seems to me it's sort of like the future of the library that we should be uh, thinking about, about bioinformatics. So um, that's that sort of thing. And then we're, we're trying to, uh, we're not just hiring new people because like all organizations, uh, we need to work with the workforce we have. And so uh, Chris Erdman at, um, um, uh, at Smithsonian Astro Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysics has been leading in uh, data scientist training for librarians and um, running courses over and over again to give people the tools to be able to work in that area. So when I talk about doing things at scale, uh, one of the things we're, we're looking at um, and saying, look backward in order to move forward. So backward, what is it that we have in libraries? Well, as this map shows you, um, we have huge print collections. And this is the distribution. I, I would say people are moving uh, now fairly assertively to share collections, share the infrastructure, share, actually integrate their collections. I'll keep this journal, you keep that journal. Um, you can divest yourself of, of the duplicates. And that enables the kind, it creates the kind of uh, uh, pathway, the circuitry that will allow people then to move into prospective collaboration. So it's a, it's a sort of trusted and known area. This one actually happens to show um, the percent that Harvard holds uh, of um, the US imprints and um, regionally. And so it's one of the things that we're trying to think about is uh, do we, how do we work with, with other people. The, in California, uh, or in the West, people are working, 109 libraries working together with six storage facilities. You see those sorts of things. Here in the UK, the UK Research Reserve had a, a, actually a fantastic project uh, to have one copy of journals at the British Library and um, two copies elsewhere in the UK. And that meant that all the other libraries, should they wish, could uh, divest themselves of their duplicates and save space. And that meant that Hefke didn't have to give them more money to build more storage facilities. So that was, um, and, and, and they actually paid you to, uh, to sort through your things and uh, eliminate your duplicates. So that actually worked out uh, very well. And then moving into, away from the print into the digital, um, Hati Trust, uh, which is now, now I don't actually know how many libraries it is, but uh, a, a number of libraries uh, in, the, in the Midwest, but then also uh, California and Ivy League libraries are putting their digital holdings there, particularly their Google Digitized Books, creates a, a digital repository. And out of that digital repository, then people are looking at um, what kind of research can be done in that corpus. I saw a note out there on the what sucks things and, and uh, what rocks uh, that said uh, humanities doesn't have data. I couldn't tell whether that was um, serious or not. But in fact, there's a lot of data and it's all that corpus of integrated uh, text is, is all a big, a big uh, data repository. So Hati is, is working um, doing that with these other um, good aims, and they are then kind of backing into being a full service operation that might 
also help think about what one does about print, and particularly uh, with monographs. So we move into, uh, and thanks to Constance Malthus of OCLC for this uh, slide, into what Constance calls multi-scalar uh, strategy, where we have these multiple uh, relationships with uh, uh, collaborating with different communities and how that will sort out. Um, sometimes I think it's quite tempting to think, well, I just want one, but I don't think that's the reality of our lives. I mean, I'm working in a matrix organization, and I think uh, that's going to be exactly what we're doing with our external relationships. So data, obviously, uh, I'm surprised the FT didn't call it the year of data instead of uh, disruption. Um, at Harvard, and you've already heard her say yesterday, uh, talking about uh, Dataverse. Uh, the library is part of Dataverse. The library helps um, support the Dataverse storage. And we're part of a number of um, uh, uh, what, units on, on campus that come together and, and think about these issues. Uh, as Marseille is, is um, proselytizing and being the ambassador for uh, people across the, uh, the world, really, to do that. And we have, um, are increasingly becoming involved in the library in data management. Uh, this is a, a, a slide that attempts to pull together the various resources that are available to people. We're about to have a data management symposium in um, either in June or September. I actually haven't heard the final date and uh, for, uh, for others to come to, and really cranking up our investment in managing uh, data. Uh, then thinking about institutions at scale, also in the library community, there's something called SHARE, which the Association of Research Libraries is, um, which is, for people who don't know, it's the 125 largest research libraries in North America which for some reason doesn't include Mexico. So it's North America above, above Mexico. And um, it is a shared access research ecosystem, that's SHARE. And they're looking at harvesting from repositories, so looking at the research assets that are available, um, notifying people about availability, and improving a, a user interface. So, but the idea is that we will um, preserve and uh, provide access to and enable the reuse of research uh, uh, outputs. And then uh, another effort also uh, coming out of uh, Washington, uh, the Committee on Coherence at Scale for Higher Education. And this is uh, something that's sponsored by the Council on Library and Information Resources and uh, Vanderbilt. So what they're really looking at, uh, this is their sort of uh, mission statement. They want to foster strategic thinking. They want to rigorously manage the transition from analog to digital. Uh, and they're looking at uh, the research and analysis of key large projects, technology for their correlation, the business plans, uh, the sustainable digital ecology of enormous scale and then uh, the return on investment. So they're talking about both public good and return on investment. Um, they're still, um, I think, uh, finding their way. There hasn't been so much recently uh, published, updated on that, but I expect they're, they're about to come out with something new. So when, I, when I'm thinking about what we're doing, I want to focus on uh, solving this year's, this century's problems and challenges, not the last. So not thinking, I'm not worried about journals anymore. I mean, about beyond the PDF, I'm you know, just beyond journals. And uh, I, I think we have to think quite globally. We have to think about the whole world. But the way in which doing things, it, it, you have to act. And that's why act is bold. Uh, so actually do things, not just talk shop. And uh, then in a very practical way, what I'm doing at Harvard is we set up our priorities, and then everything we do, I would say, how is this advancing our priori priorities? 
And so that's why I'm trying to move people from the old ways of doing things into the new and really accelerate uh, how we do things. So, you know, just to say, and the Harvard uh, Library budget, when you take all the Harvard libraries, the law school, the medical school, education, um, divinity, arts and sciences, it's $175 million, and we have 800 people working there. It's a lot of people, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of money. I had faculty, my, my first week on the job, um, come in and say, oh, we're so poor, we can't get anything. And, um, and I said, what are you talking about? You know, we're, there's no one else who is spending the kind of money that we are. And so I think we have a responsibility to spend that um, as effectively as possible. But one of the things that I want to see us do, um, actually this is a project that uh, Jonathan Zittrain has initiated at the, at the law school library, uh, which is, uh, in a very inexpensive digitization, he's calling it free the law, but it's it's uh, um, he's got a scanner that's uh, you know, six thousand pages uh, an hour or something like that, and uh, we'll do state and federal case law and make that eventually uh, freely uh, available. Uh, we want to focus on what we have that's unique, not duplicative. So. Libraries all over have these wonderful primary sources that are, are, we own those. And so we should make those available and make them freely available so that they can't be, uh, um, well, make them freely available. And then the partnering, I've already talked about that in terms of, of, of this, but one of the things I noticed, I was over here in the UK for almost seven years from 2007 to 2000, August 2013. In that period of seven years from when I left the US until I returned, what I noticed most dramatically is people are, they are ready. They're putting their money down on the table. They want to cooperate. And so whether it's Princeton and Harvard or Yale and Harvard or um, local institutions, they're doing it. So. I think that's that's really the, the big uh, change for me. Of course, we want to facilitate discovery across multiple repositories. And you know, this is what I'd be interested in hearing what you say. So I'm kind of setting out this picture that we create this huge database of resources. I'm not sure that it's the libraries that should be in the business of developing all the apps. It seems to me it's like the user communities, it's the entrepreneurs, it's, it's that. I'm not sure that's our core mission. We know how to keep things so they don't go away, for the most part. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we know about customer service, but I really think is we need to create these things so that people can um, uh, build their APIs on, uh, on them. You know, in, this, in the R's, there were lots of R's yesterday, and, and mine are reinvent, rethink, reallocate. I, I have to have this agile workforce, so I've got to give people the training they need in, in understanding data, and also social media, because I think that's another role that librarians have. Also in the world of scholarly communication, which would be to help promote um, uh, knowledge of access to quality uh, work. And so I think we could do more in, in that area. And then, because I'm a manager, it's like, okay, let's put it in the performance plan. Let's not just talk about it, let's really do it. And then I also have to, uh, you know, show me the money. I've got to put the resources there. Uh, yes, we have our collaborators to advance goals. Uh, and let go of our outdated practices. Um, we, we have not sufficiently automated our practices. And I mentioned my son who works for uh, Audible slash Amazon. You know, when I go out on a walk with him and he's, he's checking in real time the data that he's getting on, on his market. I don't even know, I've been at Widener for, at Harvard for almost a year and a half. 
I can't get the data on who's coming in the library by hour and by category. So we really need to refine and, and automate our, our practice. Um, yeah, we, we do an awful lot of work. I've got uh, uh, $17 million being spent on the cataloging and acquisition of uh, material with uh, about 150 people working on that. I was sitting, I'm on the Mellon uh, um, uh, board, and we were talking about hidden collections, and somebody said, what is that? And so I started describing um, what, what it meant to talk about collections that were not processed. And, and I suddenly thought, oh, we've got this Mellon uh, project that's going to go for several years, and it's going to take care of, um, I don't know, you know how many, uh, 150 institutions will do some project that costs $750,000 each or something like that. I thought, no, no, I'm spending 15, 17 million a year. Maybe I actually have 200 people working on it, so maybe I'm spending 20 million a year. I could be like the Mellon Foundation internally within Harvard, and if I, if I could turn the force of that capacity uh, onto, onto our work. Uh, we buy a lot of things in libraries. We get a lot of things in libraries. We store a lot of things in libraries just in case someone 100 years from now might want that. And we all have these wonderful stories to tell about isn't it great that we had these. But what are we doing for today? Are we serving our users of today enough? And I think we have to move away from the competitive proprietary approach. Okay. Um, maybe Harvard and Yale compete. They, they compete in football. They compete in, um, maybe they compete in disciplines. But do we really need to compete on our libraries? Maybe we could make the libraries a, a universal resource. And then I, I just, uh, so hidden collections. It's all about opening up what we have to people. And then maximum access is a project that uh, Radcliffe had in the Schlesinger Library which basically said, we have these backlogs and we're going to make them accessible. So how do we provide maximum access to, to what we have? And when you do that, then suddenly you can start doing research on what you've got and you can illuminate the uh, content in ways that you never could in, in a manual world. I mean, you all know this, but what's happening is, what's really important for us is the way we're seeing the manifestations of this occur much more dramatically, uh, working on uh, visualization I've mentioned before. And then as I, as I come to a close, you know, the, just the, this little example of the power of doing this. I saw that the British Library had put over a million images on Flickr, and they made them available. They are kind of random. Um, a guitarist mentioned this to the artist, David Normal. So the guitarist, here's Flickr. The guitarist in Flickr, punk rock, says, oh, you should take a look at this. The British Library has released all of these things. and then David Normal puts together uh, an art, a work of art, these large panels for Burning Man and, you know, a, the, the, a festival. So I think what we can't really predict, and this is where we were talking yesterday about um, the kind of uh, scholarly elites and then the lay people coming in. We can't predict the power of the information we have and how that can be acted on, and how that can help us in, in our uh, society in ways that the creativity of which we cannot imagine. So to just sum up, I mean, uh, so scholarly communications, libraries at scale, we are really benefiting from new technologies and new tools. It's enabling us to release new content for people we are working with a new concept of work authorship and the kind of partnering that is being done in the preparation of material and then new audiences, which I think are incredibly important for us. And I'm delighted to have been uh, part of FORCE 2015. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, we have two roving mics.
student volunteer on either side, so Chris in the middle of your side. Right. <laughs> no. um, where should we go first, Sarah? Well, Chris is right there with right, a the red it. shirt right in the front, you know. I don't have a mic. So, uh, when people think of the death of libraries, they normally think of the death of public libraries rather than research libraries. And I wondered how much what you said uh, also could refer to public libraries. Yeah, I mean, so uh, it's true. The public libraries and the research libraries are different beasts. And it makes me think of uh, uh, the architecture school at Cornell was uh, having a class in designing libraries. And so, of course, they brought them across to the library and they had me uh, talk to the students and I'm going on, I'm real excited. And then I get my first question and it was, well, what do you do with the homeless? And I thought, well, oh, we don't have any homeless here in the Cornell University Library, you know, that I have to deal with. I just ban them. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, th so there are real differences between the public and the and research libraries. But in a way, I think the public libraries are, uh, in many respects, further ahead in reinventing themselves. They have become um, these community centers. They're about connecting people with information, giving people the tools to to navigate in our in our society. They're great levelers in terms of. Um, of uh, the wealth and the access that, that, that privileged people have versus the immigrant community, for example. But I think we're, we're still very much in lead. There was a, oh, this is a long time ago, maybe 10, maybe longer. Uh, I remember an article in, in one of the library publications talking about high tech, high touch. And that's, in a way, the difficulty I have in talking about libraries. Because if I come to a conference like this, and, and I'm always terrified when these things are streamed, right? Because then people know what I'm saying. Um, and it, it's like, um, if you talk about digital, then you know, all the people who love the, the tactile sense of the book and ha have a, that special experience in the book or in the inspiring reading room feel quite threatened. And at the same time, um, I think those the people who are doing research or, or even in a public library will have the benefit of the stimulation of the access to, um, to a whole world of information. I don't know. Uh, anyway. Okay. Sorry, I And then we'll go over to the left. So it's been my privilege as being involved in Force 11 to attend a lot of conferences for groups that I never attended you know, before. And when I went to the ones from the librarian, the library science community librarians, again, I was always shocked that it was just the librarians, that there, that there was no one else at the table, especially in these discussions about data and digital artifacts, where I see the worlds colliding. And, you know, the sort of elitism that we are it seemed to be the theme of yesterday, that there are barriers that stand between groups communicating. And I, I don't know whether it's just my own perception, our own excellent library group at UCSD, but there seems to be a big wall there. Um, and what I'm very surprised at is especially in the area of data, because, you know, the scientists, I can only speak there, this is our product too. It, it, you know, it's not the library's product, it's our product. And it seemed that there was very little outreach from the library into the communities that were working in data, even on sort of in campus and whatever. It was, this is our domain, we're going to reinvent ourselves, but we're not going to engage broadly other than in this, we're kind of the experts and you come to us and we'll tell you what to do. So I always understand that I interpret everything through the lens of my own worldview, and perhaps it's a very defensive one, but I, I did get this very palpable sense and that's a barrier to cooperativity, I think. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say? <laughs> yeah, so well, I, I, I couldn't speak for US, um, um, UC, UC San Diego, there we are. Um, but, um, you know, I would say there are a couple of things that work there. One is I do feel that libraries have felt um, uh, quite challenged by all the new things. And so there is sometimes this sense of, oh my gosh, how can we take on anything more, right? So we can't, we don't have time to go out there and, and do all of that. So that's one possible thing. Um, but I think that it's, 
When I go to conferences, library conferences, I'm hearing, I'm, what I'm looking at and feeling envious about are the people who seem to have their act together, who have the data curation librarians, who have the data scientists, who, who are able to do that. But the, it's no longer going to be totally proprietary. I can't do it in the library by myself. And um, you know, I think Marseille would say that even Dataverse, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's something, it's, it's got to be a community effort. And it's a community that goes beyond your walls. And then the other thing I would say is, um, I think this is often true of research projects. When you're the PI, you own that data, right? But when your money runs out, you know, that data is orphaned. <laughs> they, people don't, they want to move on. And so, uh, you know, there's always these stories of, of having to come in and rescue uh, data that, that does still have value uh, before it gets to be too late. And so one of the other things we talk about is having, you know, you want to be up higher in the food chain so that you're there when that data is, is really being thought about and being created rather than just picking up the, the bags as the person moves on. Entirely, yeah, absolutely, I agree. Yeah, but uh, a bit, a bit uh, continuing what Marian just, just said, even in areas which are much more traditionally the library world, because data is sort of new, um, I feel this kind of wall. The, the area where I got involved at some point is the area of metadata. And metadata is overall in the publishing world, and publishers invest enormous amounts in metadata. And, you know, cataloging is metadata. And these two worlds never meet. You know, you have vocabularies that are developed in parallel in these two communities, mm -hmm. and they don't even talk to one another, which is detrimental. No, I, 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 I very much uh, agree. Uh, and uh, I hope that we will move beyond that. Uh, I really do. But years ago, I worked at the um, National Agricultural Library, a little known uh, park. I went there. I had never been there before. And I looked it up in a guidebook, and it said it was the home of the Poultry Hall of Fame. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I thought, oh, there are going to be famous chickens on the wall. But at any rate, one of the things I was in charge of were the people who index for the Agricola database. And they had one vocabulary, and then the people who did cataloging. And, you know, we had two different systems, two different, multiple different uh, descriptors. And as I would try to bring them together, they would say, oh, no, we're different. We're not the same. And, uh, you know, I just hope that we, we don't have the luxury of saying that anymore. And our users are, um, they're using multiple outputs. And so, really, the, all, we ought to be thinking about how we're helping them engage in their world. Okay. Uh, um, I'm Gail Clement. I'm a research librarian at Texas A&M, and I am a scientist that uh, then became a librarian. And I wanted to, if nothing, just support um, what um, Sarah Thomas is saying about some of the librarian um, barriers. And I think there's that, that it's really important that those folks that aren't librarians or um, don't even play one on TV, that you um, understand that the librarian profession itself is so quickly evolving and that there's a huge generational component. And I don't mean age or chronology. I mean your point of entry into the profession. So if I relied on what I learned in library school, to do what I do, which is really being a science informationist. Um, I'm deeply embedded in the authorship practices. I'm training on new authorship practices. And that's because I was a scientist first, so I don't just rely on my library training. But I think that if you came into the profession as, as recently as 10 years ago, and possibly today, depending on where you got your master's degree from, you're just grossly inadequately prepared for these new roles. Um, and if you hire more recent graduates of more recent information schools, high schools, people that maybe trained with a Christine Boardman, um, then you would be hit, ready to hit the ground running. So it's really important not to paint our profession 
with one broad brush. Um, some of us have been doing this for two decades and we've just been considered feral and weird and don't fit in. And so my title is actually Special Projects Librarian because there's just no app for that right now. I lead ORCID integration, you know, crazy stuff that just doesn't fit in the traditional uh, library degree playbook. And so I think that when you look for partnerships in libraries, um, you know, you need to be permeable about who you may have to talk to three people to get the one that will engage and doesn't have um, a fear. And I think the fear is based on knowing that our preparation has been grossly inadequate and that the fundamental issue might be that library information schools need to be transformed to meet the new skills that were on an earlier slide. And I don't know what your experience is with hiring and whether you're looking for new uh, approaches to hiring or whether you're willing to hire in library. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I come from Boston and I am a lifelong Red Sox fan. Um, but the, the point being that, you know, we even at A&M are having debates about whether, because we're tenure and promotion faculty, whether we can give one of our library faculty lines to somebody who, <gasps> does not have an MLS, that has an informatics degree, that has a GIS degree, possibly even a PhD, and that we have that faculty wars around whether someone like that, so feral, could occupy a library faculty line. So just so you know what it looks like from the inside, um, it's a really difficult time right now in the library profession. So, so respond to that and then we have a question. Yeah, so I would just say that well, I, I'm, I'm quite, I have quite a broad church in terms of, uh, uh, I think that we, one of the things I loved at, at, at being at Cornell, well, it was a place that incubated a lot of things, but it, there were employee degree programs. I had like 11 people who took the executive MBA program. I had people who did <laughs> computer interaction degrees and, and uh, soil scientists and bioinformatics. And so it was, it, it was a very rich uh, environment. And, and so, you know, we just don't have one size fits all. So one doesn't need, you know, a cookie cutter librarian coming out of a, an iSchool. One needs diversity in, in all things, I would say, in the workforce. Thank you. Question in the middle. We'll then break for coffee. We can continue the conversation with Sarah. This actually follows on directly on the same conversation, really. And I'm an example of that. I'm, I'm not a librarian. I've got a PhD in scholarly communication and have been employed as head of scholarly communication at Cambridge through my PhD. And my previous role in my old library at the Australian National University was also in relation to having had the PhD in research. But we're finding, and I don't know if this is an Australian thing, but um, in relation to the skill sets, the trouble that I'm having, well, not now, it's not my problem anymore, but um, with some of my other colleagues in this area, is trying to convince the people who are putting together the library courses that they need to incorporate some of these skill sets and this knowledge base into the course because they can't see that they have a, a skill gap in their own knowledge. And so they see that as threatening. And so they say, no, we don't need to put something on scholarly communication into a course because it's all covered. Think, really? And there's nothing about open access, there's nothing about repository management. And so these poor people suddenly get dumped with, oh, guess what, you're the repository manager. There's no courses for them and you have to learn on the job. Thankfully in Australia there's a good community so you can ask, ask your mates, but it's not really structured in any way. And it's a major problem because, it, and, and the, the block there is people who are quite high up in the system, either in the librarian role themselves or running the courses for libraries, who can't see their own, the, the gap in their own skill set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, <so> <laughs> Did you want to make a final comment? Uh, yes. Can we get Mike? As yeah. the director of an LIS program. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say that that it's um, shall we say widely variable. <laughs> um, we just instituted a digital humanity certificate, and I just sent. Um, the entire freshman master's class to a Java server page database course with the idea that their term project was an institutional repository. So I, I think that it is the case that many of the traditional programs are 
you're not going that route. But I think there are places where you're seeing an interesting blending of the traditional and the digital. And that's actually what we pick up as our tag phrase. I have people who make a paper on my faculty. Um, and this is curation level Library of Congress paper. Um, but it's the case that there's an ex it's odd, it's an extreme resistance in the students on this content. I mean, I've got tenure, I don't have to worry about my teaching evaluations, right? But you'd be surprised at the reaction to people coming into those programs thinking about what librarianship is as opposed to what they're going to need to know in a context like that. Yeah, I, I'll just say while you're saying that, I, I mean, of course, people send young people to me who are interested in libraries, in going to library school. And then, you know, when they come in and they say, well, you know, I always have loved books. You know, and my heart sinks because I think, I think what, what does she think we're going to be doing? Because I have to say, you know, I used to be a really big reader. And now I'm, I'm only doing email and, and things. But, you know, the people need to understand that the profession is very different than, um, than, it, than our, I think our common stereotype is of it. Final, final. Sorry. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I do think it's important to recognize, though, that oh, Robin Shampo from Oregon Health and Science University, that much of what we've been talking about over the last few days, and even within your talk, um, there is uh, <coughs> sort of cultural and uh, sort of professional change that needs to happen within a lot of scholarly communities mm -hmm. to make the advances that we want to make. And some of that needs to happen in librarianship as well. But in terms of that sort of cultural ethos and change, we're far ahead than many other people. So, you know, the um, embracing open access, freedom of information, a respect for privacy, these are sort of, um, these are, the, the, these are the, the qualities that define our profession. And so I think sort of seizing on those uh, strengths um, and not necessarily focusing on, or uh, uh, sort of recognizing this, where that moves us forward in ways, and the and collaborations and innovations that can come out of just that starting point, but um, recognizing the sort of skill change that needs to happen as well is something that comes hand in hand. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's good, and I would just like to end, just in case anybody thought, you know, <laughs> libraries. I've worked in libraries for 40 years. It's like a fantastic job. I couldn't have ever had uh, imagined the opportunities. I mean, when you're a little kid and you think about, oh, too bad the West has already, you know, the pioneers have already been there and people have already been into outer space. And then one day I thought, I'm living this adventure with the internet and we are these, these pioneers. In, in libraries and everybody in this room. And how exciting is that? And I have wonderful colleagues in libraries, and so I would never want to paint it as a backward profession. But, you know, we, we all have challenges, but it's, it's really, um, the, my colleagues are terrific. So, thank you. <laughs>